Let's take off. For those who came here today expecting something from the Holy Spirit of God, who came here expecting something from man, I hope you did not show up today expecting something from me, because you'll be greatly disappointed, I tell you what. I have nothing to offer. If you would turn with me to John chapter 14 today. And in John chapter 14, Jesus, he is teaching his disciples, and he's telling his disciples, I have to go away, I have to go to the Father, and I'm sending one. I'm sending somebody in my place. You know, oftentimes, we forget about the person that he's sending in his place, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. And we will be teaching and preaching on the Holy Spirit of God today. So I'm going to read, and then we'll pray. So in verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it has neither seen him nor knows him. You will see him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells within you, and he will be in you. And I will not leave you, as orphans, I will come to you. Lord, would you just take Caleb Hulsebus out of the equation and fill me with the Holy Spirit. May your words be lifted up, God. I pray that people's hearts would be changed. You would do a work that I cannot do. You would just work in this place, Holy Spirit, and you would just begin to move in people's hearts. That people would be changed, people would be saved, people would be set free in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I was trying to come up with this message. I was trying to figure out, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? Weeks started going by, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? I have no idea. I was flipping pages. I was in Genesis. I was in Habakkuk. I went all the way to Revelation. I was like, Lord, there's nothing here you want me to preach on. I even ended up in the map section. But I tell you what, the map section doesn't have a lot of gospel truth in it. <laughs> I was like, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? I could not figure it out. And I, I sat back and I was like, and the Lord was like, preach on me. Because so often we preach on things and we preach on people, we preach on even pastors. But very rarely do we preach on the Holy Spirit of God. You know, he is the third person of the Trinity, often the forgotten one of the Trinity. We've made it Father, Son, and Holy Bible. But it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is still moving in the churches. You know, I find it interesting. Lots of times, we end up worshiping the scriptures. We end up being all about intellect and not about what God is. We be all about intellect and not the presence of God in our lives. What can I know? What can I teach? And what can I preach? And very rarely is about the presence of God. So, we're going to preach on the Holy Spirit of God, and that's introduction for you, so you can start timing me here. <laughs> so, in John 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love who? God, God yes, keep on talking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, not the things of this world, not jobs, not success, not the pleasures of this life, not friends, not fame, not your sin, but if you love Jesus. Lots of times in this life we miss the focus. We miss our direction like I was saying in last. Our direction can be shifted. And like Stephen, Stephen was a deacon and that guy could preach. He would preach wide open. He would call anybody out in the book, and he preached the true gospel Stephen did. And Stephen was the first martyr. And when they drug him out of town, and they were going to stone that guy to death, they were going to stone Stephen to death, the religious Pharisees and Sadducees, always, always critical of what God's actually doing. Everybody, there's a lot of religious people, they are so critical of what God is doing and what God is working in people's lives, that they explain it away. If God is doing something in the church, I don't want to be able to explain it. 
my guy's not that big, I can explain it. So, Stephen, when he was getting, the stones were coming at him, baseball-sized stones, they were beating his face in all bloody. Where was Stephen's focus? It was his focus was on Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, he stood up for him. He literally stood up off of his seat, and he looked down at Stephen, as Stephen was getting beaten to death by stones, and his focus was never misdirected. And we can get misdirected a lot of times. So, and I can get misdirected a lot of times. I did not have this in my message or I written down, I just penned it down. So last night, I was sitting in, well, I was actually laying in bed and I was like, I was getting ready, you know, I was running through my sermon, kind of preaching it to myself. And the Holy Spirit convicted me of something. He's like, you've been focused on performance rather than the presence on this message. And that is convicting because I was like, people have expectations. They want to see me excited. But I was focused on performance. I had to get up here and I was missing the point. I was missing the presence of God in the message, even though it's supposed to be on God. And so a lot of times in life, we can get people pleasing and loving people mixed up. We're supposed to love Christ because he first loved us. So in a lot of churches and a lot in the culture, we have a lot of people pleasers. These people, they want something so they please somebody to get something. And they want a return out of it. They have the disease to please. People will get offended by the gospel. If people don't get offended, you're not preaching the full gospel. There's a difference between loving people and pleasing people. Just about every time I get up to preach, I don't know if my dad told me this or not, but he said, when you get up to preach, never look for the approval of men, but look for the approval of God. Because if I am looking for the approval of men, it is very difficult to accomplish a single thing for the kingdom of God. Because people have opinions, people will say stop, people will say you're not doing it right, and they're not doing a darn thing. So, look for the approval of God in your life rather than the approval of men. It says in Galatians 1.10, For am I now seeking the approval of man, of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, and he's saying, if I'm trying to please man... I would not be a servant of Christ no more. So the difference between loving people and pleasing people is this. People pleasers is looking for the approval of men for selfish gain. They have an agenda. Where loving people is looking for the approval of God for self-sacrificial loss. In 1 John 4.19 it says, We love because he first loved us. You will keep my commandments is the next part. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, what is true love? True love is demonstrated by your action, not your words. Because we have a lot of talkers... And not a lot of people that demonstrate true love. And true love to Christ and keeping his commandments is obedience to Christ. Is obedience. True genuine faith is demonstrated by obedience. A fake faith is all talk, no action. If you have no obedience, you really have no love for Christ. If you are not willing to obey him when things get difficult, when things get tough... 
you really have no obedience and no love for Christ. So if you turn with me, if you want to, to Galatians 5, chapter 16 through 25. I might read it. I might kind of pick it apart just a little bit because it's, we got a few verses to get through today. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things you do you want to do but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalries dissensions divisions envy drunkenness orgies and things like these i warn you as i warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of god those are pretty strong words. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step by, by the Spirit. So what does it mean to gratify the flesh? Because as we learn to blast, there's three enemies in this life. There's the flesh, there's the world, and there's the devil. The flesh is this. It's your sin nature. It's, you're going to give in. So to gratify means to give in to the flesh. To grant it. What fights the flesh? Fasting fights the flesh. We don't like to talk about that because we'll end up skinny. <laughs> Fasting fights the flesh because it is disciplined and it's saying no to the desires of the flesh. Because the flesh has an agenda. The flesh has a will. The word fights the devil. When he comes against you with lies, you come against them with the word of God. As Jesus was in the, when he was going through the wilderness, he fought the devil with the word. One interesting thing, though, about the third enemy, the world. We do not fight the world. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it changes the world. It changes the world. To keep my commandments is, not, is to not gratify the flesh. Last week I was sitting in the pew and Jason was preaching wide open. And I was sitting there, I was like, Jason, steal my message. Because <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to bring up 1 John 3, 4 through 10. But that's how you know that the Holy Spirit's speaking. Jason's saying, saying the same thing, and I got it written down in my notebook. This is what I want to say. So the Holy Spirit was downloaded into us. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one keeps on sinning has either seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. As he is righteous, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep sinning. Because he has been born of God, by this is evident, who are children of God, and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not good, God, uh, not of God. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. So what does it mean to practice sinning? You know, I always kind of like to think of it this way. With people that play sports. People like you play basketball, you play football, you play volleyball, you play, do gymnastics here, some of you. you. You go to the gym, you practice at it, you work at it, you get good at it. The same goes with practicing sinning. You're getting good at it. You're getting sneaky about it. 
You're practicing it. You're developing it. You're identifying it as it. Because there is a difference between struggling with sin and practicing sin. Struggling with sin, when you commit a sin, gets you to turn back to Christ. And it gets you to have humility. It gets you to have repentance. It gets you to have recognition of your sin. Practicing sin has nothing to do with that. It does not want humility. It does not want humbleness before the Lord. And it does not want to confess it. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Everyone born again, believers, should have the desire to live holy. You should have the desire to live right before the Lord. If there is no desire, the Holy Spirit is not directing you to live before the Lord in a holy manner. That's not meaning that you're going to be perfect, but that means that you're going to live before the Lord and you're going to try to be righteous and you're trying to be right because the measuring stick is holiness. The Holy Spirit guides a believer to grow in righteousness. All plants grow, as we learned. And what it says, you should be more like Jesus, more like Jesus today than you were last week. Than you were but the day before you should be closer to him you should look more like him because you know what's one funny thing that's evident if you spend a lot of time like a lot of time with the world you will look like the world you'll pick up the worldly habits if you spend a lot of time with christ if you're in the word if you're in prayer if you're asking the holy spirit to guide you to teach you to show you areas of your life you'll look more like christ You won't be perfect, but you will be different. That's for sure. Because I find this very interesting. It seems like a lot of times I've noticed is we like to hold on to the fact that we're imperfect humans. We like to hold on to, yeah, I'm imperfect. Yeah, I'm going to sin. But does that make your sin any less destructive? Does that make your sin any less against the word of God? You won't be perfect, but you will be different. Because you have crucified the old man. His desires are dead. He died with Christ in the grave. And Christ rose again out of the grave, bursting with new life. And he has given you new life. He has filled you with the Holy Spirit. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Well, now we're kind of getting to the meat of the text and kind of where I wanted to go today. I wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit of God and who He is. You know, something that's kind of interesting is that in churches, we have minimized the Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues in some churches. We've minimized them just to salvation in some churches. We've minimized them just to the um, works of the Spirit. We've minimized them to the gifts of the Spirit. We've done all these things. We've minimized him to where he is at demonstration of what he does rather than who he is. I will ask the Father and he will give you another. So it's showing and it's demonstrating the Trinity of God. Don't ask me to explain it because I will totally butcher it, the Trinity of God. I don't think there's anyone on this planet or anyone in, the, in heaven that can explain it. John 1, 1 through 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And I will ask for another helper. So, the word another... Means if you went to your good old burger joint and you had a cheeseburger, and you you like that cheeseburger a lot, and you were like, I need another one of those. I need another cheeseburger. So you went back up to the counter, you got another cheeseburger, and that's what the word another means in the Greek. It means the same thing, just again, because the thing with when Jesus was on this earth, Jesus was one man. He was one person. He couldn't be everywhere at once. 
The Holy Spirit can be in us, in each believer, and then be in the churches 2,000 miles away from here. He can be in each church and each person at the same time. So who is the other helper? He's the third person of the Trinity, or often the forgotten one in the Trinity. There are people who say, I want it. Have you heard that? Where people be like, I just need a little bit more of it. Meaning the Holy Spirit of God. Just need a little bit more of it. But I'm here to tell you today that the Holy Spirit of God, He's not a power, He's not a force, He's not a wind, He's a person. He has person-like attributes. Because a lot of times we've minimized him to a force. He just comes in and he's a force. I'm going to list a whole bunch of verses here real quick in a little bit. So if you want them later, if you want to write them down, you're going to have to go fast. They're chicken scratch notes, but they're printed out. He has insight, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. He has knowledge, Romans 8, 27. He has a will, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He convicts sin, John 16, 8. Guilt is from the devil, conviction is from the Holy Spirit. When you are ashamed and you're feeling guilty about something, about a sin, that guilt is from the devil because he wants to, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you to live in that guilt, live in that shame. And Jesus Christ, he came to take that shame away. He came to take that guilt away. Guilt is from the devil. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning the sin and righteousness and judgment. He performs miracles, Acts 8.39. And somebody say amen in this church if you're glad that Jesus Christ is still healing the sick. If Jesus Christ is still moving in their churches. Because the Holy Spirit of God is still moving in our churches and he's still healing the sick. And he's still moving and he's still delivering people. We like to minimize them. We like to put them in a box. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. He guides, John 16, 13. He intercedes between persons, Romans 8, 26. He is obeyed, Acts 10, 19 through 20. He can be lied to, Acts 5, 3. But he knows when you're lying to him. He can be resisted, Acts 7, 51. The Holy Spirit, he is a gentleman. You have to invite him into your life. You have to ask for him to come into your life. If you want the Holy Spirit of God at arm's length in your life, you can have him at arm's length in your life. You have to invite him in. He's not like the devil. The devil will push his way in, and he will pry his way into your life, and he wants to wreak havoc. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised, uncircumcised in your hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers so did you. He can be grieved, Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He can be blasphemed, Matthew 12.31. He relates to Acts 15.28. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. It's impossible for the world to know the spirit and to know who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And, to, and they will never give him credit for what he does, because the world has never seen him nor known him. They have to be born again to know him. They have to receive new life. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
How do you receive the Holy Spirit? You receive the Holy Spirit upon salvation when you get born again. When you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. By the heart, one believes and is justified, and by the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive, to receive it, you have to be born again. You have to repent of your sins. You have to ask Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. And there needs to be a repentance, a recognition, and a turning away. We have left that out in many churches, the repentance. So, I'm going to give you guys a little kind of fun story. Probably lighten the mood a little bit. So, at school, there's an induction furnace. Have you guys ever been around an induction furnace? Any of you guys ever heat treated any parts? I doubt it. <laughs> Maybe just me, because I'm a little weird. So, an induction furnace has coils running in it. Big electric coils. They run all around in it. It's not like a gas furnace that has a big flame. It just heats it up. It kind of works like your electric oven, but just a thousand times more. And in the induction furnace, that furnace will get up to about 1,750 degrees. And you'll grab the tongs, you'll grab that part, you'll have the gloves on. They'll open that door and that big orange, you'll feel the heat and you'll kind of bend away. You'll put that black in and it starts sizzling your gloves. The detergent in your shirt starts smoking out. And it's getting hot and you're like, man, I'm going to have a sunburn in the middle of winter. <laughs> so the induction furnace, every time I heat treat anything or put anything in that furnace, I always think hell is hotter. No matter how hot that furnace is, hell is hotter. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. And the Spirit of the Lord will not be there. And you will be thirsty, and your thirst will go unquenched in Luke 16. So, if you do not want to have the fire and the judgment that comes, you need to be born again. And you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if you do not, you will have the cancel culture that really matters. Is a cancel culture in this day and age where they cancel you off of social media? That doesn't matter. The only cancel culture that matters is Matthew 7. Depart from me. I never knew you into iniquity and everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and the angels. When God says depart from me, that's a cancel culture to be worried about. The great thing about the Holy Spirit of God is you can have the same relationship that Jesus' disciples had with Jesus. You can have that same relationship as you do with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't realize it. They don't take advantage of it. So I kind of like this one analogy that this preacher had. He said, on your physical birth, you're born with legs. But you do not know how to use them. You do not know how to walk. No child comes born out of the hospital walking. If he does, that's a little weird. <laughs> On your second birth, if you've been spiritually born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean you walk in the Spirit. That does not mean you keep in step with the Spirit like it says in Galatians. You have to grow. You have to mature. And each, you know, it's something that's kind of interesting. We like to put like celebrity preachers, celebrity pastors, up on this high pedestal, nobody can have that same relationship with the Holy Spirit. Nobody can be that close with the Holy Spirit, but each and every one of you, if you've been born again, you can have that same relationship. There is no A team, there is no B team in the kingdom of God. It's one team, and it's for Jesus. You can be as close as you want to be to the Holy Spirit, or you can be as distant as you want to be to the Holy Spirit. It's all up to you. It's your choice. If you don't want them, you don't need to have them. 
But he seals you until the day of redemption. So I just say, the challenge for this week, so you guys go out, take the steps and try to grow your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Try to walk in with the Holy Spirit. Try to keep in step with them. It does not mean you're going to be perfect, but you will be different. That's for sure. Put away the desires of the flesh and cling to the desires of God. Build your relationship this week with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. It's up to each and every one of you. If you want to spend more time in prayer to build your relationship, you can do that. If you want to spend more time reading the Word to build your relationship, you can do that. It's all up to you. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no formula. Just spend time with the Lord. Get to know Him. And you'll start looking like Him. And less like the world. And we have to be the light to the world. We have to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because how are they supposed to know the gospel if we never tell them? We have to tell them that they need to be born again. Verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What a promise that is right there. I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you by yourself. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I have to go. But I'm sending the Holy Spirit. So you're not going to be orphans. And the greatest promise is, I will come to you. When we hear those trumpets, and Christ is calling us home, because this world is not your home. Too many of us, we like to cling on to the things of this world. That the world is passing by, it's fleeting. In Psalms it says, what is man? His days are like a shadow passing by. What is man? His days are short. His days are brief. His days are quick. What an amazing promise that is. If you have never been born again... I can't get up here and preach a message without giving salvation. Too many preachers will preach a message but never give salvation. Salvation can never be left out. If, you, if a person got up here and they preached all about salvation all the time, it would be a great message. So if you've never actually accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I urge you today that you would do it so that you do not have to spend eternity in the light of fire and you will receive the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're unsure about your salvation, do not leave here today without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because one day you will stand before him face to face. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. So it's whether you kneel now and confess him now, or you confess him and kneel when you have to. Make no mistake, each and every one of us will kneel, and each and every one of us will confess, and each and every one of us will give an account. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit this week. Let him work, let him flow into your life, and let him change you, because he's the only one that can change you. He's the one that's working. He's the one that's being used. And give the glory to the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. I'll leave you with this. Acts 2.17 And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, and see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That's a promise. And acts, he shall pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And I had one more thought, but I kind of forgot it. <laughs> but so go this week and try to live and keep in step with the Holy Spirit. You will stumble, but try. Because in each and every believer, there should be a desire. If there is no desire, there is no born again. Because the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and he gives you each and every one of you a desire and he leads you unto pass more righteous. We'll pray. We'll be done. 
Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you for today. I pray, God, that you would just work. The Holy Spirit would just work in people's lives. You would change people. You would grow people. You would mature people. Most of all, you would just work, and you would get the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.